Time Warner Cable is pleased to be an underwriting sponsor for Carolina Week. Coming up on the April 14th edition of Carolina Week. I'm Chris Neal, and I'll show you how students and faculty are reacting to more potential budget cuts. The race for U.S. Senate is underway in North Carolina, and candidates are vying for your vote in the primary. In sports, we go out to the Bosch to find out what's wrong with the baseball team and what are football concussion researchers discovering. It's a little chilly today. Weathercaster Morgan Brooks will tell us when we can expect the warm temperatures to return. All that and a new restaurant in Chapel Hill will calm your cravings for sweets. Carolina Week starts right now. From the James F. Goodman Studio in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, connecting campus and community, this is Carolina Week. Reaction tonight from students and faculty about proposed budget cuts. Good evening, I'm Bethany Tuggle. And I'm Andrea Blanford. Thanks for joining us. It would be the second year in a row that the state cut funding to the university. The legislature has proposed a 5% budget cut, which could bring major changes to our campus. Chris Neal joins us live in the satellite studio with more about this story. Chris? Andrea, UNC President Erskine Bowles is opposed to the budget cuts that are on the table, and he's not alone. Campus officials, faculty, and students are worried about how the cuts will affect UNC in the coming semesters. The 2009 system-wide budget cuts caused the loss of more than 900 jobs. Most of them were administrative and didn't directly affect students. UNC System President Erskine Bowles is afraid the newly proposed 5% cuts will result in the loss of faculty jobs, which has students concerned as well. Honestly, you know, if we are short of teachers, then what, what do we do? You know, like, we're stuck. Nearly 1,000 workers system-wide could lose their jobs, potentially resulting in larger classes and fewer sections offered. Students registering for classes today via the new Connect Carolina system are already complaining about the difficulty of finding the necessary courses. Well, being that I'm a rising senior, um, if there are a lot less sections offered, that kind of poses the threat of not being able to actually get into those classes, not just for seniors, but for other students as well. Associate Provost and UNC Registrar Christopher Derrickson says his colleagues are also worried about what the cuts could mean for course offerings and the quality of education here at UNC. We cut back on the faculty members. Those students are going to have to fit into a class somewhere. So what's going to end up happening is those classes are going to have to get bigger is going to cut down on the individual interaction the faculty can have with their students. Although it's still unclear what specific changes might come with the budget cuts, students and faculty alike are bracing for the worst, but hoping for the best. We've already been thinking ahead, knowing that these budget cuts were, were coming in ways that we can work smarter. I know it's a cliche, but ways that we can work smarter and give more of our time, more quality time to students. While the proposed budget cuts are just that, proposed, not definite, campus leaders are stepping up to oppose the loss of faculty jobs. Chris, what's the biggest concern among faculty and students? Andrea, most people I spoke with are concerned about the standard of education at UNC diminishing if a large number of instructors lose their jobs and classes have to be cut. Mm, all right, well, it could be a tough fall semester. That's Chris Neal starting us off this evening live in our satellite studio. Thanks, Chris. Fall registration is here and students are trying to get the classes they want, all while using a new system. The university implemented Connect Carolina to make registration more efficient. Connect Carolina specialist Deborah Beller says the system will also unify university databases and help with the financial aid system. Some students like the new system, others aren't so sure. I really like it. I like the shopping cart. I've got like 12 classes in there right now. The Connect Carolina system is a complicated system. It is hard. Hit, um, I guess, whatever it was, enroll, and bada bing, I was done. And it was really easy, especially since I was registering in the middle of class. <laughs> so. Walk up help kiosks are available on campus this week for those who need help with the new Connect Carolina system. New developments tonight in the Eve Carson murder trial. Attorneys for DeMario Atwater have been seeking a change of venue, stating their client wouldn't receive a fair trial in North Carolina. A federal court judge has denied that request. Atwater will be tried in a Winston-Salem courtroom starting May 3rd. He's charged with killing former student body president Eve Carson. If convicted, he faces the death penalty. Also new tonight, the stagehand arrested and charged with second-degree rape will face an Orange County judge tomorrow. 
According to a search warrant released yesterday, David James Kerr admitted to having sex with a woman accusing him of rape. He says it was consensual. The incident happened at the Carolina Inn. Kerr is a stagehand for the New York-based Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, which performed at Memorial Hall during the weekend. He remains in an Orange County jail under a $70,000 bond. North Carolinians are gearing up for the Senate elections, and Chapel Hill residents recently got to question candidates directly. The National Senate candidates, except for incumbent Republican Richard Burr, gathered at the Sonia Haynes Stone Center Auditorium last night to answer questions from local residents. ABC 11's Fred Shropshire moderated the discussion. They discussed topics including education, unemployment, health care, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The panel included Libertarian candidates. Candidate Michael Beitler, Republican candidate Larry Linney, and Democratic candidates Cal Cunningham, Ken Lewis, Elaine Marshall, and Marcus Williams. Students here on the UNC campus are remembering those who died during the Holocaust. Joseph and Victor Kimbert and his daughter Alta, Laser Kimbert and his wife Batia. The names you're hearing are names of people who died. From Monday at noon to Tuesday at noon, the NC Hillel sponsored its annual 24-hour reading of the names. The event is part of a semester-long initiative to educate students about the Holocaust. Students read names in 10-minute shifts through the night for 24 hours straight. Hillel also set up stations for people to make mem memorial ribbons, read about UNC students' connections to the Holocaust and donate to the Dimes for Darfur. The Chapel Hill community is saying goodbye to a well-known civil rights activist and UNC law professor. Dan Pollock died on March 5th at the age of 88. Pollock participated in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s and advocated for gay rights. He taught at the UNC School of Law. His memorial service will be Sunday at 2 p.m. at the Friday Center, and it's open to the public. Fires can destroy everything you care about. People who ride at a local horse farm are still dealing with a profound sense of loss after a fire that killed 13 horses. A horse grazes beneath the sun as the wind rustles the leaves on the nearby treetops, painting a picture of serenity at Foxwood Farm. But on the other side of the picket fence, the piles of debris, scattered pieces of metal, and wilting flowers serve as reminders of the loss. This is all that remains of that stable, but not all was destroyed by the flames. Nine horses survived in this stable, which was left untouched by the fire. Alex Rescue has been riding at the farm for almost a year. Her horse, ironically named Blaze, was one of the nine. She says she can't imagine what it would be like if he had been in the fire. It's kind of something that you can't really think about happening because it's really, really hard. It's like a piece of you is gone. Maddie Swift is a member of UNC's equestrian team and knows the special attachment riders can have to the animals they spend hours taking care of and training with. Horses are very unique animals. You have to ride each horse differently. So it's more than just losing, you know, your pet who you take care of. It's losing something you create a bond with. Rescue also knows about this bond and just hopes the other riders can find it again someday. I would just say to keep going and you know maybe there's another horse out there for you that can teach you something new and help you overcome the loss and you can bond with them. Perhaps then there would again be serenity at Foxwood Farm in Chapel Hill. We tried to get a comment from the manager of the stable but her husband says she's still too upset to talk to anyone about the tragedy. In other news, students will have a new late night eatery in the future. Wendy's is coming to UNC campus. Beginning in 2012, Alpine won't be the only food option in the student union. The new Wendy's will be located on the bottom level, which is already a popular study area for students. The union board of directors voted in favor of the new restaurant Tuesday and says plans are also in place for more local and organic dining. Board members want a place that students recognize with low prices and late night dining options. Cookies, cakes, burgers, and fries. We all know some food can be bad for your health. That's right. Coming up, a new study suggests high-fat diets increase your chance of getting each one in one. Honey? The credit fairy doesn't exist. What? It's make-believe. Nobody left anything under your pillow. If there's no credit fairy, then we'll make our credit score go up. 
We will. By doing things like paying our bills on time. There's no magic to improving your credit, but there's help, and it's free. Go to creditferry.org. What? Sherry Pearson. You are the sole surviving heir of the King of Montanopolis, and you are now worth $45 million. <gasps> I'm rich! It can't be real. Of course it's not real. Come on. Having money isn't about luck. Like that takeout meal. Cook at home instead, you can save thousands a year. Feed me. Feed the pig. Diets high in fat lead to a number of health problems, including diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. Health reporter Taylor Clark tells us about a new study that reveals why high-fat diets also make you more susceptible to H1N1. According to a study from UNC's Gilling School of Global Public Health, high-fat diets can weaken your immune system's ability to combat the flu. Nutrition professor Melinda Beck explains the basis for her research. Obese individuals are more susceptible to viral infections and more susceptible to bacterial infections. So we were interested in trying to understand why would that be. PhD student Eric Carlson worked with Beck to answer this question. Carlson gave young mice like these either high or low fat diets. He then infected both sets of mice with what he described as a minor virus, H3N2. Once the mice had recuperated, Carlson infected them with the more deadly H1N1 virus. What happened next was a turning point in the study. 25% of the obese mice dying and, and all of the lean mice surviving. Carlson says the critical factor in determining the survival of the mice is memory T cells. They help the body to remember how to combat infections. A diet low in fat helps the immune system to remember how to protect the lean mice from H1N1. However, a diet high in fat created an impaired memory T cell that could not remember how to protect the obese mice from H1N1. Obese mice are unable to make a memory response to influenza virus. Carlson says the mice model has human implications. If it is translatable to uh, a human population, uh, especially an obese human population, then a significant portion of the world's population may be at risk for uh, influenza infection. Infections that healthy memory T cells would ward off. For more information about the study, you can find it in the March 15th issue of the Journal of Immunology. In Chapel Hill, I'm Taylor Clark, Carolina Week. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that at least 30 percent of adults in North Carolina are obese. That's 30 percent of the state's residents more likely to get H1N1. Do you have your morning cup of joe with TV personalities? Some students' favorite host paid a visit Monday evening. Mika Brzezinski, co-host of MSNBC's Morning Joe, signed copies of her new book and met with fans before talking about her life, family, and competing roles. She spoke fondly of her childhood in Washington, D.C. and her, her father, a national security advisor to President Jimmy Carter, and also talked about her artist mother. Brzezinski gave career advice and spoke of her constant struggle to balance her career and family. The speech is part of the Distinguished Speaker Series, an initiative that was the brainchild of former student body president Eve Carson. If you haven't filled out your tax return by now, you're running out of time. This was the scene earlier today at the Jackson Hewitt and Carborough in the H&R Block here in Chapel Hill. You can expect things to pick up soon. Tomorrow is the deadline to get your tax returns in the mail. You have to have your return postmarked for April 15th to avoid any penalties unless you've already asked for an extension. Well, you know, I was expecting another warm t day today, mm -hmm. but I had to get my sweatshirt out again. I know. What is going on with this weather? Weathercaster Morgan Brooks is here to tell us. It has been chilly and cloudy today, but there mm -hmm. is a warm-up ahead of us. Coming up next, I'll tell you about the warm-up ahead and when we're going to see that sunshine come out again. I 
Bratou! Foreign languages! And finally, biology! Who among you will step up to their challenge? Me. Yeah, do it. Me too. Sign me up. Take on the tough classes now. You need them to prepare for college. No juegues con fuego. Solo tú puedes prevenir los fuegos forestales. Hey guys, this is my teenage friend Rachel. She's cool. Hey. Hey, could you watch the road? Hey, could you watch the road? Okay. All right. Well, if we die in a car crash, I want to donate my eyes to my neighbor Gary. He has a boat, and he sails all around the world. I would love to see that. I don't know if he actually needs eyes, but who would turn on a free pair of eyes, right? <laughs> Who's that rich? Welcome back to Carolina Week. I'm weather forecaster Morgan Brooks with your five-day forecast. Today has been pretty chilly outside, but those above average temperatures we are seeing in the past couple of weeks are gonna come back up. Tomorrow we're gonna to see temperatures in the upper 70s and Friday even in the upper 80s. We're also gonna see sunny skies. Unfortunately, it looks like that pond's gonna stick around for a while. Taking a look at the US satellite, we see cloudy skies all over central and eastern North Carolina. This is, this is the rain and clouds that was in the area last night. Fortunately, that's gonna move out tonight and we're gonna have sunny skies tomorrow. The surface map, again, here's that rain that was in the area last night. And then for the next couple of days, we're gonna have clear skies. But over to the west, there's this low pressure system that is headed our way, and there's a few rain showers along with it, but that's expected to weaken by the time it reaches us. So we might see a few afternoon showers on Saturday, but it really won't affect your day too much. Tonight in the Triangle area, we're gonna have a light southeast wind with uh, temperatures around 43 degrees. It's gonna be pretty chilly. If you're headed out tonight, dress warmly, 43 is cold. We're also gonna have partly cloudy skies. It'll be, uh, it'll be a pretty cold night. Tomorrow we're gonna have a high around 78, so much warmer than today, and we're gonna see clear skies, nothing but sunshine. The wind's not gonna be very strong, only around five miles per hour. It's a pretty good weekend to head to the beach, go out and get a tan. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit cold in the Outer Banks, around 66 is your high, but in Wilmington and Myrtle Beach, we're gonna have a high almost of 80 degrees, mostly sunny all up and down the coast, fortunately. It might not be quite a good a day on Saturday for a hike in the mountains, as we do have a chance of showers in Boone and Asheville. In Roanoke, you should be pretty clear. Temperatures will be in the mid 60s. Taking a look at our pollen trend, pollen is ranked on a scale from zero to 12, 12 being the most highly concentrated. And if you had trouble today with the pollen levels, you're also gonna have some trouble tomorrow as pollen levels will stay about the same. So make sure you take your allergy pill or bring a box of tissues with you because it's still gonna be pretty bad out there. Taking a look at our five day sky conditions, we see sunny skies tomorrow and then for the rest of the week just Mostly sunny skies, again, that chance of isolated storms on Saturday, but really nothing to worry about. Our temperature trends shows that Thursday we're gonna see high temperatures around 78, Friday 86, and Saturday 80 again. It's gonna be a nice weekend. I'm looking forward to it. Me yeah. too, I'm ready for these warm temperatures to Me come back. Me too, thanks Thank Morgan. You. Thank you. Well, you might want to rush right out to the animal shelter after seeing this. Check out our pet of the week. He's young, but he's wise. Yoda is a six-month-old pit bull boxer mix, and he loves to play ball. He's neutered and vaccinated and ready to go home with you today. He's good with other dogs and children and loves kisses and cuddling. If you'd like to adopt Yoda, go to our website, carolinaweek.org, for a link to the shelter. 
but it looks like Yoda loves playing ball. And mm -hmm. I hear we have a Tar Heel who might be getting paid to play ball. Sure do. I cannot believe Ed is leaving us. Sportscaster Justin Page is here to tell us more. Yeah, for better or for worse, that is, that's right, Lauren. Um, or not, excuse me. Ed Davis mm -hmm. is leaving for the NBA. But coming up after the break, we'll, we'll tell you that it's about more than just talent. My name is Emily, and in seven years, I'll be an alcoholic. Hi. Hi. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. So start talking before they start drinking. When life's this hard, graduating can be even harder. But you can help Jose and the students in your community make it through by visiting boostup.org. In 1977, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. The odds of that same boy then making it to the US and European pro golf tours? One in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the US Open twice? One in 1.2 billion. The odds of him having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 150. Ernie Else encourages you to learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports, I'm Justin Page. The Diamond Heels host Coastal Carolina this evening at Boschimer Stadium, and our Nick King is there now. Nick, what's going on over at the Bosch? Thanks, Justin. As you can see, the 10th ranked Chanticleers of Coastal Carolina are warming up on the field right now. We're a little bit under 40 minutes from our first pitch. And so far in 2010, things haven't gone quite as smoothly as they did the last four years. Things started out well enough, but since the team hit conference play, it's been a little bit of a struggle. The Mike Fox's four most recent teams, all of which made the College World Series, never lost more than 10 games in conference. Right now, only halfway through ACC play, this team's already lost nine games. And the bad news? They still have to play at Clemson, at Miami, and at Virginia. All three of those teams are at least 10-5 and five in the ACC. And though current postseason predictions place the Tar Heels as a three seed in the South Carolina Regional, it won't be an easy road to get there. Mm. Probably not. Nick, what seems to be the biggest problem for this team right now? Well, Justin, a lot of it's been bullpen related. The team scored enough runs, but when pitchers Matt Harvey and Colin Bates leave the game or have the day off, Lee Teppen has been safe. And another thing to think about, 10 of the 17 pitchers on this roster are either freshmen or sophomores. Mm. Well, let's hope they grow up fast. Thanks a lot, Nick. Live at Boschmer Stadium. Football is a violent sport, and head injuries, though rare, can be devastating. Sports reporter Gabe Hyatt shed some light on research aimed at reducing those injuries. Little and Quan Sturdivant define the story of spring football this year with their decision to forego the draft and stay at UNC for one more season. It's also the final year of football for a man you might not know. Dr. Kevin Guskowitz leads a six-year study on concussions and football players at UNC. Next football season counts the final year of the study that gathers data from dime-sized motion sensors placed in football helmets. We're able to measure in real time the location and magnitude uh, of those impacts to the helmet. A concussion is basically a bruise your brain suffers because of rapid acceleration and deceleration of the skull. It's like your skull is this egg and your brain is the yolk. The study recorded more than 200,000 football collisions in 100 different players. The data showed just how many concussions are too many before risking long-term brain injury. While many people have refused to put a number on it, uh, our work's beginning to suggest that once you've had three, it may be time to, um, to hang it up. 
Coach Butch Davis reacts to this type of information by teaching the game with less full contact workouts than back when he played. You can teach, uh, you know, football players to play the game and be smart about the things that you ask them to do and still get them prepared to play in the games. The modern approach taken by coaches like Davis and the increasing body of knowledge on concussions contributed by scientists like Guskowitz are part of the reason concussions in NCAA football have been in decline since 2005. In Chapel Hill, I'm Gabe Hyatt, Carolina Week Sports. Dr. Guskowitz plans to focus his research on special teams players in the fall. And as we reported on Monday, Ed Davis is headed to the NBA draft, and new information may shed some light on exactly why he's leaving. Davis's father said a possible NBA lockout factored into Ed's decision to leave after only two seasons. The NBA collective bargaining agreement will expire after the 2010-2011 season, and without a new contract, a work stoppage could occur. Obviously, David wa Davis wants to get to the league before that happens. And beyond avoiding a work stoppage, Davis's draft stock is sky high. ESPN's Chad Ford projects Davis as the seventh overall pick. Davis brings an athletic 6'10 frame to the table with go-go gadget arms. He was the third fastest player to reach 100 blocks at UNC. But some worry that the raw Davis needs at least one more college season to refine his skills. So we certainly wish Ed the best of luck in the NBA, for better or for worse. Uh, hope, let's hope he made the right decision. That's right. Thanks, Justin. Thanks so much. Coming up, we'll take a look at what's cooking in Chapel Hill. That's right, and this food comes with a little French flair. Stay with us, mon ami. If you have a story idea, call Carolina Week at 919-843-8292 or email us at carolinaweek at unc.edu. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina 27599. Be sure to check out Carolina Week and Carolina Connection online at carolinaweek.org. Listen to your uncle Johannes. Raisin bombs make you grow up smart and successful so you can be a doctor, a lawyer, a handsome genius composer like me. Feed your kids the arts. Visit americansforthearts.org. Treat your family to Van Gogh, packed with live and active culture to boost kids' math and reading skills. It's sure to satisfy your hunger for inspiration. Feed your kids the arts. For 10 simple ways to learn how, visit americansforthearts.org. If you ever find yourself craving some authentic French food, we might have found just the spot to try. Elizabeth Lamb takes us there. Walk down West Franklin Street past the hustle and bustle of campus and you'll catch a whiff of French cuisine. Native Parisian Véronique King crafts savory and sweet crepes from scratch. She moved to Chapel Hill from France six years ago when she met her husband while a docent at Paris's famed Louvre Museum. Now that she's here, she's focusing on another type of art. How does she do it? Ha! Huh. It was like if you were asking me, uh, how do you make pasta? Crepe Véronique opened only two months ago, taking over Bliss Boutique's cupcake restaurant space. King says she uses organic, healthy foods to fill her crepes, like bananas and, well, a bit of chocolate. It's all about yourself, it's all about what you have, it's all about, there's no rules, there's no recipes. So far, business has trickled in and King has found there's a learning curve in how to run a business. It's, it's already very hard, harder than I thought, but uh, it's a challenge for myself. For those who find all things French a challenge, King also tutors French students how to put the A in tre during off hours. In the meantime, though, she spends her afternoons cooking up translucent crepes on the crepier and keeping up shop. So what's her biggest secret to success? You have to be French. And how do they taste? You be the judge. In Chapel Hill, I'm Elizabeth Lamb, Carolina Week. <laughs> well, those crepes sure do look good. They do, they do indeed. That does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thanks so much for watching. Good night.